morning. Good morning. Uh, Second Timothy. Second Timothy chapter two. I haven't talked about this for a little bit. And uh, Second Timothy two fifteen. Amen. Very important verse. 2 Timothy 2.15. See, if you was going in for a job interview, found a help wanted ad, and they, they had, on, had a list of required qualifications in order for you to get that job. Say, so say one of the qualifications was you were required to have a four-year degree. Guess what? If you don't have a four-year degree, you're not qualified for the job. You're not approved for that job. Well, Paul tells Timothy here that there's something required in a workman. It's not, it's not uh, optional. Right. This is a requirement of God. Look what he tells Timothy here in 2 Timothy 2.15. He said, study to shew thyself approved unto who? This is a personal, personal uh, responsibility between an individual and God. Doesn't matter if you've got a got an ordination paper from the United Methodist Church. And it doesn't matter if you've got a seven-year degree uh, from Dallas Theological Seminary, Moody Bible Institute, whatever you want, wherever you want to go. This is a personal, individual responsibility between the man and God. He is showing himself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, look at this, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so from this verse, we see that rightly dividing the word of truth is not some hobby horse we like to harp on, right? It is the very skill required to approve yourself unto God. It is a required skill in a workman. When God's looking at a workman and he's, 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 he's judging whether that workman is approved unto him or not, the very skill he's looking for is whether that man rightly divides the word of truth or not. Think about that now. You say, now how do you gain this skill? Well, what's the first word in the verse? Study. Study. You cannot gain this skill that approves you unto God without study, right? Now, if you, if you believe this verse, as I just read it and as I just explained it, if you believe this verse, then point blank period, a man who doesn't rightly divide the word of truth is not approved unto God. Amen. Right? Come on. You just read the verse. Do you believe that verse? I believe that verse. Now, now if a man doesn't rightly divide the word of truth, then he's not, he doesn't have the skill that God's looking for in a workman that approves him as a workman unto God. Now, this man may be approved by the sword of the Lord. You, you, may, you may see this man's picture 15 times on the sword of the Lord. Right? This man may be approved by some, some seminary. They may give him an honorary doctorate. Won't be. I mean, they've done it all, for all kinds of men. Right? I, I, know, I know men right now that I, I've known for 30 years of my life in the Baptist church. Couldn't write, as, as Donnie Holt would say, they can't rightly divide a Kit Kat bar. <laughs> but, 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 but they've got honorary doctorates. From a bunch of Baptist preachers decided to get together and, and put an approval on them of giving them a doctorate. Do you know what a doctorate is, guys? It means a teacher. When you give somebody a doctorate, you are, you are certifying that that man is qualified to teach. Now, God said if a man doesn't rightly divide the word of truth, he doesn't have the skill necessary to be a workman with his word. And so, yeah, they may have approvals for men, sword of the Lord, seminary. You know, they, 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 may, they may be ordained, as I've already said, by the United Methodist Church, Southern Baptist Convention. Campbellites may approve of them, Church Christ guys, you know. Ruckman called them water dogs, you know. <laughs> but, but the Campbellites, you know, you got Church of Christ guys out there, and the Church of Christ approve of them, and independent Baptists. Your family may even approve of some of these men. None of which makes these people approved unto God. Right? The mo one of the most despised men outside of the Lord Jesus Christ 
One of the most despised men that ever walked this earth was the Apostle Paul. That man was approved unto God. Amen. Now, once you're brought to the reality of this fact, y'all follow me so far, right? Once you're brought to the reality of this fact, that, that rightly dividing the word of truth is a skill required by God in order for his approval as a workman, once you're brought to the reality of this fact, if you continue to approve those who are not approved unto God and continue to disapprove those who are, what does that say about you? Amen? You want to continue ignoring what God said, right? You want to continue uh, disregarding and forsaking those who are actually approved of God and continue giving yourselves over to men who are not approved of God, what does that say about you? Well, what it says about you is you could care less about God's work. Amen? Amen. You don't care about God's work or God's ministry. If you cared about God's work and what God was actually doing, you would give yourselves over to the skilled workmen who actually know what they're doing in the ministry. And quit giving your time over to those men who don't. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Rightly dividing is the very skill needed as a workman ministering to God, the word of God. So why do so, why do so few preachers rightly divide? Why is it that men can go to seminary for seven years and not acquire the skill? Now listen, listen. If it's the skill required of God, then don't you think that's a skill that should be taught in a Bible seminary? Amen. Makes sense to me. Maybe the Bible seminaries don't know what they're doing. Amen. Dallas Theological Seminary, you know. Moody, Fuller, Wheaton. Piedmont, you know. Maybe these, maybe these universities don't know what they're doing. Pensacola Christian College. You know, Bob Jones and all these places. If, 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 if you send a man down there and he gets a four-year degree from that university and he comes out of that university supposedly as a minister of God's word and he doesn't have the very skill that approves him unto God, you just wasted four years of your life in that Bible seminary. Well, how does it happen? How's a man spend 30, 40 years behind this desk, supposedly teaching and preaching the word of God and never acquire the skill that God requires as a workman? Yeah. I know exactly how it happens. Look at, the, look, at what the, look at what the verse said. Study. You say, well, they study. Yeah, but they don't have the right motive. Now, get what I'm about to read you. What must be the motive behind your Bible study? Read it. Study for what purpose? To shew thyself approved unto God. If you have any other motive in your Bible study other than that, you ain't going to get it. You must have the motive of personal approval unto God and nothing more. I could care less what Shelton Smith thinks about me. And to be right honest with you, I could care less what any of the mid-acts dispensationalists think about me. I'm not in it to pre please them and approve myself unto them either. I'm not in this to approve myself to Richard Jordan. I'm not in this to approve myself to Justin Johnson or anybody else. I study the Bible for personal approval unto God and God only. Amen. Amen. That must be the motive in Bible study. And so what I'm telling you is this. A man who studies the Bible for 40 years and never develops the skill of rightly dividing the word of truth, that tells me all I need to know about that man's motives. Amen. There you go, folks. You don't like it? I don't care. I'm telling you the facts this morning. A man who's been studying the Bible their whole lifetime, men who's been handling the word of God their whole lifetime, but never acquire the skill of rightly dividing the word of truth, he has unclean and impure motives. That man has alternative motives, which are not to show himself approved unto God. You say, what's his motives? Well, it could be just to prove a denominational doctrine. 
I, 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 you know, they may search the scriptures and study the scriptures to do nothing more than prove what their denomination teaches. I mean, the church of Christ got their verses, don't they? Matthew 28, 19, Mark 16, uh, Mark 16, 16, uh, 1 Peter 3, 21, Acts 2, 38. They got their verses, right? Fundamental Baptists got theirs. Malachi, robbing God of tithes and offerings, you know. And uh, they've got their verses, forsaking not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, Hebrews 10, 25. They got their verses. The Methodists got their verses. You know, I will sprinkle clean water upon you, Ezekiel. <laughs> well, you think I don't know them verses are in the Bible? I do. The reality is, is this. Some of them are proved studying the Bible and using the Bible to prove their denominational standards. They're not studying the Bible to show themselves approved unto God. Some people use the Bible to, to simply do nothing more than to prove what they already have come up with and what they've already uh, uh, believed in their heart. You watch these people quote half a verse. You know, 1 Peter 3, 21, the like figure of which baptism doth also now save. There ain't a Campbellite in the world that don't quote that verse like this. Peter said baptism doth also now save. No, Peter said the like figure. Figure. Right? Water baptism never saved anybody. Jesus Christ is the Savior of all men. Amen. Now, if Jesus Christ tells you to be saved you better, or, or to be baptized, you better be baptized. But the reality, the reality is this. Some, pe some people just use in the Bible. They just use it. Right? They have no skill in it. There's no, there are, listen, Probably, I, I would hate to even guess how many churches are in the United States of America. I'd hate to guess. There's a lot of them. There's a mess of churches in America. Now, let me ask you this. Out of all the churches just in the state of West Virginia, how many churches in the state of West Virginia do you think honestly have a skilled workman behind the pulpit? That's, that's, there's where we are. People say, people call the South the Bible Belt. My foot. It's a church belt. It's all it is. You go to Georgia, you go to, you go to Georgia, there's a church every quarter mile. But it ain't a Bible belt. Right? It's, these places are pagan houses of worship where people gather together to worship a God that they've created in their own mind. Some, some men just study for popularity in a certain group. They want, they want to be accepted by a certain group of men. The, 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 the point is this. Very few men study the Bible for no other reason than for personal, than, than for personal approval unto God. When I study my Bible, when I study my Bible, I'm looking for God to correct me. I'm not, I'm not, listen, if God's going to show me something that's going to cause me to go against people that right now agree with me, if God corrects me on something, I'm going to receive the correction. Amen. I don't know it all, guys. My goal every morning is for God to correct me. I wake up wanting God to correct me. I wake up every day wanting God to instruct me. I wake up every day seeking to reprove to myself the things of the Word of God to see if what I believe is so or not. I'm constantly proving these, those things over and over and over to myself. Amen. And if I'm, going to be, if I'm wrong on something, I want to know it. And if I find out that I'm wrong on something, you people will be the first ones to know. Why is rightly dividing such an important skill? Pe people act like when we get up and say rightly divide the word of truth, they think we're saying, well, Psalms is not true. First Peter isn't true. Only Romans through Philemon is true. No, they're all, the whole, the, listen, we're not talking about rightly dividing the funny papers. We're talking about rightly dividing the word of what? Truth. Everything in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is true. You know, I, I say, my carpet's blue. Jeremiah says, my carpet's red. Guess what? Both can be true, guys. Right. 
One of them's about my carpet, one of them's about his carpet. You know what Christianity do, does? Instead of studying to rightly divide that stuff, they're going to spend the rest of their life fighting about what color the carpet is. Yeah. Right. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. That's what they're going to do. Um, baptism, repentance. That's another big argument, repentance. Yeah. Is repentance required for salvation today? Listen, man, what are you repenting of? The issue is not repentance. The issue is what are you repenting of? Are you, are you supposed to repent according to Acts chapter 2? Is that the repentance? When Paul went to Athens, Greece, did he stand up in Athens and say, and look at them Athenians and say, Jesus of Nazareth, who was approved among you by God with many diverse wonders and miracles, and you with wicked hands have taken and crucified him. Did Paul preach that to those Athenians? No. What was he preaching to the Athenians? He said, I seen an altar that had this inscription to the unknown God. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Yeah. Were the Athenians to repent? Yes, but not of crucifying the Lord of glory. They were to repent of their pagan idolatry that they'd been involved in for thousands of years. God now commands all men everywhere to repent. Right? But your, your repentance is not in accordance to Acts chapter 2. I believe Christians should be in a state of repentance. God, I believe in godly sorrow, guys. I believe godly sorrow worketh repentance. I believe the word of God uh, many times is designed to work godly sorrow in us. But why is rightly dividing such an important skill? Well, the entire Bible is true from cover to cover. But in this Bible is massive amounts of information. There's a lot of information in this Bible. There's a lot of doctrine in this Bible. This Bible talks about heaven and earth in it. Right? It talks about thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers in heaven and earth. Can you comprehend them? Because I can't. How much power, how much power, principality, how, how much authority is just in the state of West Virginia? When you start talking about fathers, that's a power. Believe it or not, that's a power. Husbands, head, right? You start talking about all the families, all the local governments, municipalities, the state governments, the county governments. When you start just looking at the state of West Virginia, how much power and authority is just in this state? Then you look at all of the United States. Then you look at all the kingdoms of the world. And then you look at all the powers in, in, in heavenly places. Yeah. How much power is there in heaven and earth? Right? And you, you, listen, God, God, God called a family over there in the book of, uh, over there called Israel. And in that family, he chose a man named David. And David's, David's family is chosen to be kings in Israel, not you. Amen? Amen. Guess what? There's allowed to be portions of that Bible not about you. It's allowed. You see, the Bible contains a lot of information about heaven and earth. There's information in the Bible about Israel. There's information in the Bible about the nations. There's information in the Bible about various time periods. You're living in the year 2021. How much time came before you and how much time is coming after you? And you think, you think that God from the beginning of the world was writing a book that centers around you when you are just a vapor that appears for a short time and then vanisheth away? There's a lot of information in the Bible, guys. And the reason we have to rightly divide is not because one part of the Bible is more important than another or that one part of it's true and the other part isn't. The reason we have to rightly divide is because you have all this information and it is a necessity that we study the information and then organize all the information into its proper and right divisions. Amen? 
And if you do that, you will have the skill required of God as a workman. If you don't do that, you're just going to keep adding to the godless confusion of this world's religious system. The bickering, the contending, the fighting, pre-tribulation, post-tribulation, post-tribulation, pre-wrath, you know, all this stuff. Right? Yeah, listen, listen, guys, I want to I want to tell you something. It's not enough for you to be biblical. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. That's biblical. Let no man judge you in, in, in meat and drink, respect of a holy day, no moons or Sabbaths. That's also biblical. Okay? Look at, look at Matthew 28. Let me show you this. Come to Matthew 28. You can't just spend your life going around quoting a verse thinking that's the end all of all things. I love it. I love it when some little young, young kid comes up to me. I had, had a boy down in North Carolina. You know, he was preaching that old Baptist, yeah, that, old, that old Larkin Schofield doctrine that the seven churches are seven church periods, you know. Basically, Baptist history. <laughs> you know, that's how them guys handle it. And uh, he was showing me that stuff in Revelation 2 3. And I said, I said, there ain't a, I said, not a one of them churches are looking for the rapture. Yeah. I said, they're all looking for the second coming of Christ. Yeah. And he, I said, there is no rapture in the book of Revelation. Right. And of course, he, he's like, oh, yeah, look here in Revelation 4 1. Oh, yeah. I said, son, I was reading Ruckman 15 years before you were born. He ain't going to show me nothing I don't know. I've heard it all, man, from these guys. Mm. I, I love it when people, people try to, they come at you and try to show you a verse like you didn't know it was in there. Yeah. <laughs> you see, I'm not playing games, guys. I'm in the book. Amen. I study the book. And, and, and the reality, look, look at Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore. You see them words, go? <laughs> All right, now keep up here. Go ye. You know what that means? They're sent. Christ sent them. Right? Go ye therefore. Now what's he tell them to do? Teach all nations. Look at the next word. Baptizing them. Now this ain't, listen, we're not talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost here. Not a one of them men had the, had the ability to baptize any man in the Holy Ghost. That's a what? Jesus Christ is clearly talking about a water baptism. Right? Acts 2.38, when they asked Peter, what must we do? Peter said, repent and be what? Baptized. Why would Peter say that? Because that's what he was sent to do. You just read it. Go ye therefore. Go ye. They were sent, and they were sent to baptize. Okay. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. People say, do you not believe Matthew 28? I believe Matthew 28 with all my heart. It's true. There ain't a doubt in my mind those 12 apostles were sent to baptize. I can read. I know what Jesus Christ said. But I also believe 1 Corinthians 1 17. It's true also. For Christ sent me not to baptize. Now guys, if words have any meaning, they're both true. These apostles over here they're sent. What are they sent to do? Teach all nations, baptizing them. Now here's Paul. Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Yeah. What are you going to, listen, man, you got to deal with that stuff. Don't look at me like I'm, I'm the one that's crazy. Somebody's sent to baptize, somebody isn't. You got to deal with it. It ain't my issue. 
I've studied. I've resolved the issue. The issue's yours. I tell you, I tell you this. I tell you this much about it, man. I tell you this. The Campbellites, at least the Campbellites are honest. The Church of Christ is honest with these issues. They'll tell you they're preaching the Jewish kingdom. Church of Christ guys are all millennialist. But I tell you what, they're more honest with the text than a bunch of Baptists. Right? Amen. He that believeth and is baptized shall be what? Saved. Yeah. They, they, listen, the Church of Christ is more honest with the scriptures on water baptism than the Baptists are. That's right. Right. A Baptist makes it up. Yeah. They don't deal with the text on water baptism. Yeah. Listen, listen. Baptist spends his whole life running his mouth about, oh, we, we are closer to the truth than any of them. Listen, here's, here's another one they say. We, 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 the, the one thing they brag on is their baptism. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Baptism by immersion. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm going to tell you something about the Baptist church. The Baptist church believes in water baptism, but they don't believe a single word the Bible has to say about water baptism. They, they, they want to hold on to water baptism, but they don't want to believe what the Bible actually says about it. Here's what the Baptists say. Now, you don't have to do it to be saved, but you have to do it to join our local church. Yep. Chapter and verse. <laughs> Chapter and verse. Give it to him. No, you don't have to do it to be saved, but it is a show. It is an outward show of what took place at salvation. Chapter and verse. Chapter and verse. Paul said, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now let me, let me ask you this. this. Let me ask you a simple question. Somebody was clearly sent to baptize. Somebody wasn't. Now let me ask you this. If a man is sent to baptize and he doesn't do it, is he obedient? If somebody else is sent not to baptize, but to preach the gospel... And he doesn't preach the gospel, but he water baptizes and says, it's biblical. Is he obedient? There you go. There you go. If Paul would have went around doing what Christ didn't send him to do and ignoring to do what Christ sent him to do, he was not obedient. You know what that tells me? You, we can sit and argue about this. Till the cows come home or till the Lord comes. Those 12 apostles and the apostle Paul obviously had two different commissions. Amen. They're sent to do two different things. And when you read Galatians chapter 2, Paul said, when he said, he that wrought in me for the apostleship, he, or he that wrought effectually in Peter for the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. When they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. There's two commissions. That's why one of them was sent to baptize and one of them wasn't. You say, what is that? That's rightly dividing the word of truth. How did you learn that stuff? I studied to show myself approved unto God. I came to a point in my life where I said, God, whatever denomination is right, I want to know. And through further study and research, God showed me none of them were. Right? right? Take the Antichrist. Antichrist, biblical doctrine, right? It's the main conflict of the scriptures, guys. The Bible begins with a conflict between a serpent and a woman. Her seed and his seed. Right? Remember when Christ, this is playing out, John chapter 8. Year of your father who? Yeah. The devil. What were they doing? You seek to kill me. Yeah. The seed of the serpent took the seed of the woman and nailed him to a cross. The Antichrist is a biblical doctrine. There's more information on, 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 on the Antichrist in the Bible 
than any other figure other than the Lord Jesus Christ. There's all kinds of information about the Antichrist in the Bible. What I'm showing you is it's, there's more required of men than to be biblical. Okay? I've heard people, I've watched people since I was a child. Bill Clinton was the Antichrist. Baptist preachers stood up all across, all, all throughout my childhood. It was Bill Clinton the Antichrist. Then Obama was the Antichrist. I watched documentaries on Donald Trump and how he was the Antichrist. I've heard people say it's Jared Kushner, Donald, Donald Trump's son-in-law. <laughs> right? Chapter and verse. You see, just because you know that there's an antichrist, getting up and trying to handle stuff you don't know what you're dealing with is just going to cause confusion in this world. Amen. Look at 2 Thessalonians, I'll show you. 2 Thessalonians 2.6. The antichrist, I know he's coming. But the Bible, the Bible gave you everything you need to know about when he's coming. And any, anybody that's telling you that he's come when it ain't even his time is a liar and a deceiver. Yep. Amen. Look, at, look, at, look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6. Is that the verse where he says, And now you know what withholdeth? That he might be revealed when? His time. You see, so, so a person... Who knows that there's an antichrist is biblical. A person that knows that he's being withheld to be revealed in his time is somebody that studied and rightly divides the word of truth. He is, he, is a, he, is a, he is a skilled workman. He's not going to get you out here looking for things that ain't real. People telling you that somebody is the Antichrist when it ain't even his time and he's being revealed is somebody lying to you and deceiving you and getting you messed up. Amen. Are they biblical? Yes. Are they skilled workmen approved unto God? No. You know what 1 John says? Little children... 1 John 2, 18. Flip over and read it. Now, I, I, don't want to think, I don't want you to think I'm making anything up. See what Paul said? Paul said, now you know what withholdeth. That he might be revealed in his time. Anyone teaching he's coming before his time is unskilled. I'm going to tell you something about these people. Every time you, every time you jumped on YouTube and believed one of them, oh, oh this person's the Antichrist. How many times they've been right? Zero. They've been wrong 100% of the time, and they're going to be wrong 100% of the time after this. Because it's not his time. Amen. You ain't to be looking for him, folks. Now look at 1 John 2, 18. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard... Who shall come? That Antichrist shall come. Okay. How can, listen now. <laughs> if Paul is writing at a period in which he's withheld, and it's not his time, and then John said, it is the last time, and as you have heard, that Antichrist shall come, how can Paul and John be writing about the same period of time? That stuff is clear. So how'd you get it? Study. Right? I'm going to tell you something. You listen to people that don't understand that stuff and you're just going to be ignorant and deceived. Amen. Look at Revelation 13, 5. There was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Power was given unto him to continue for how long? Boy, that's pretty specific, ain't it? Isn't that pretty specific? Remember that, remember that his time? Do y'all remember that? You know what his time is? It's seven years. 
It comes from Daniel 9, 27. God has already defined the time of the Antichrist. He has seven years. Right? Now here, power is given unto him to continue for how long? 42 months. That's the last half of that seven years. Now look at verse 11. This is everything that needs to happen before the world even needs to consider worrying about the mark of the beast. It's here for 42 months of a specific time period. Now look at verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him. And causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. Where's that at? Whose deadly wound was healed. Can y'all show me any of this? With great wonder so that he maketh fire come down from heaven. Yeah, boy, I've seen that. In the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by sword and did live. Y'all found that yet? He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Where's any of this stuff going on? Now look at verse 16. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark of the name of the beast and the number of his name. You know what that is? You got a bunch of people going around talking about things. They have no idea what they're talking about. The mark of the beast belongs to the 70, 70th week that's been determined upon Israel and Jerusalem. Right? Titus 2. Look at Titus 2. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Get Titus 2.13. Get 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 12. What's interesting about that is 3.12 and 2.13 are mirrored. Right? Titus 2.13, 2 Peter 3.12. Right? Now... In these two verses, God says to look for something. All right? Look at Titus 2.13. Go back up to verse 11, first off. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world, looking for. You see that? Looking for what? That blessed hope. The glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me ask you this. If you're sitting in a church, if you sit in a church for 30 years and you're not looking for that blessed hope, what's wrong with your church? Amen. Don't tell me you're under the grace of God and you ain't looking for the blessed hope. I didn't say you wasn't saved. I'm telling you you ain't being taught right. The grace of God that teaches us, teaches us some, some facts. The things he's teaching us is to deny ungodliness. That's what he's taught me. He's taught me to deny worldly lust. He's taught me to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And he's taught me to look for something. He's taught me to look for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what the grace of God is teaching today. Now look at 2 Peter 3.12. Looking for, y'all there? I'm waiting on you. 2 Peter 3.12. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God in which the elements will melt with fervent heat. You see that? <laughs> see those words looking for? You say, you say, are both true? Yeah, they're both true. Are they the same event? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Now, now, let me ask you something. If somebody's being told to look for something and somebody's being told to look for something else, are they the same group? Couldn't possibly be, could they? 
right? Now, in fact, Peter, Peter tells them the reason the day of the Lord hadn't come yet is because of something revealed to Paul. If Paul, if what given to Paul interrupted the coming of the day of the Lord, then what was given to Paul has to be fulfilled and played out before the day of the Lord can come. That's why we're looking for something completely different than what they're looking for. We'll, we'll look at this some more this morning when we get into the morning service. I'm going to try to do a little bit of an overview of the Bible. Guys, when you understand your vocation, you understand why there has to be a rapture. You're not it. God, God did not call you to give you a piece of land in the Middle East. God did not call you to, to replace David's house as the kings of Israel. God did not call you even to inherit the nations. God called you. You are a, you know what God is doing today? He's making in his son one new man. What do you know about this new man? I know about, I know about the first man. The first man was given dominion over the earth. I know that. I read my Bible. You say, what is this new man? I know everything about this new man. That he is seated in heavenly places. Amen. And that we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in this man. And us who were dead in time past, when we walked according to the course of this world, God, when we were in that state, he, he, raised, he quickened us, raised us, and seated us together with him in heavenly places you and I as the new man have a heavenly vocation our vocation Paul said our conversation is where in heaven from whence also we look for the savior you know where he told you to set your affection on things above not on the things of the earth and when you understand that we have a heavenly vocation, you also understand that there must be a day that Jesus Christ comes and calls us up to where God has chosen us to perform. That's why we're looking for an event to call us up to meet him in the air. Israel is looking for his return to the earth. Oh yeah, folks. That's 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 the skill the Bible will give you if you just study it. Look at First Thessalonians chapter four. I got a few minutes here. We're going to continue this this morning. Y'all enjoying this? First Thessalonians four. <laughs> I love this man. Just read and believe the words, man. Paul said, now look, verse 13, he says, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. You know what he says at the beginning of chapter 5? But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write. He says, now there, he says, there's something I don't want you ignorant of, but there's something else over here that if you're ignorant of it, it's okay because you don't have any need. Right? If I, if I, listen, listen. If you're going out of town Friday, right, and there's a hurricane and a tornado coming Saturday and Sunday, but you're not going to be in town, you have no need that I write unto you. It's that simple. There's clearly something Paul doesn't want them ignorant about. Let's, let's look at it. Look at 413. He says, he says, now, Concern, he says, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as, even as others who have no hope. Look in verse 15. For this we say unto who? You. By the word of the Lord. That we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore.
Comfort one another with what? These, these, these words. But of the times and seasons, you have no need that I write unto you. Okay. You got it? I would not have you ignorant. This we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. That's clear. Now, you, you, say, you say, well, well, Paul's just saying that, that, that no man didn't know. That's not what he said at all. I can show you every person in the Bible except Paul wrote about the times and seasons of the day of the Lord. Isaiah wrote about them. The day, Malachi, the day cometh that burneth as an oven. Amos wrote about the day of the Lord. Jeremiah wrote about the day of the Lord. Ezekiel. Did Jesus Christ in Matthew 24, was he telling them about the times and the seasons? They said, they said, they said, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Did Christ write to them about the times and seasons of the coming day of the Lord? Did he speak to them about it? Did Peter write about it? Did John? There's only one man in that Bible who said, you don't have any need that I write unto you. Okay. You figuring it out yet? The reason you don't have any need, and the reason, there was, the reason there was no need for Paul to write about the times and seasons of the coming day of the Lord is because you and I are going to be called up to meet the Lord in the air before that day comes. Now look, at, look, in, sec, look in Revelation. I'll show you. Look in Revelation. Paul says, you have no need that I write. Well, look at Revelation 1.11. Jesus Christ here talking to John says, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, do what with it? Write. Write in a book. <laughs> okay. Now get this now. You have no need that I write. Jesus Christ tells John, what thou seest, write in a book. Now what's, what, is, what is the purpose of what John's writing in the book? Go back to Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to do what? Shew unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Yes. Right? Now, Paul, now, now, now look at verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, they that hear the words, and, and, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. For what reason? The time is at hand. Now, now let, let's, let, let me put this in perspective. You got one writer of the Bible that says, you have no need that I write unto you, and another author of the Bible who was specifically told to write some things in a book for the purpose of showing somebody the things which must shortly come to pass. And you think they're the same. Let me tell you something. If the Apostle Paul was an apostle to us Gentiles, and you and I, the body of Christ, if we're going to be here to go through the 70th week of Daniel and Paul did not write something unto us about that time period, he's not a faithful minister. The reason Paul didn't write anything to you about that time period is because that time period is not for you. Right? The only thing Paul writes about that time period is in 2 Thessalonians after he told them they didn't have any need. He writes 2 Thessalonians because they're still being troubled by, by, by spirits and by letters as from Paul and by false men out there that's trying to convince them the day of Christ is at hand. And Paul said, I beseech you by the coming of our Lord and our gathering together unto him that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. This is why all this stuff's important. You know what? All these people out there who say, oh, Donald Trump's the Antichrist. 
for Joe Biden. Joe Biden's the Antichrist. It's every, it's every United States president that ever comes on the scene now, they say he's the Antichrist. You know where, you know, I know where the Antichrist comes from. I know where he comes from. I know exactly what part of the world to watch. God tells you exactly where he comes from in the book of Daniel. He don't come from Washington, D.C., I promise you that. And he don't come from Europe. He comes from the Seleucid division of the Greek Empire. It's called the King of the North. It's modern day Syria, Turkey, that area over in there. I know exactly where he comes from. He's called the Assyrian all through the Old Testament. I know where he comes from. The point I'm making is everybody gets up and tells you that this man's the Antichrist, that man's the Antichrist, that man's a liar, and that man's a deceiver. One last place. I'll shut up. We'll, we'll, pick up, we'll pick up here in the morning. I still got a lot of material to go through, guys. I got, I've went through one page of my notes, and I got three left. So. <laughs> we'll, try to, we'll try to get through some more of this stuff this morning. I'm probably not going to get through all of it. But I hope, I hope you understand the point I'm making is that everything we talked about this morning is true. But it's, it's so much information that we have to study it and get it into its proper divisions. We get an organized system of understanding the word of God. And then we, we become skilled workmen who are able to labor with God in the ministry of his word. You can't just go quoting verses and think, well, it's in the Bible. Therefore, yeah, it's in the Bible. It's true. But you don't know how to properly Handle it. You're not skilled to properly handle it. Just throwing a verse out there. Right? All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the many blessings of life. We thank you for the precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for redemption. Thank you for the adoption of a child, Lord, and, and for my heavenly vocation and my, my inheritance that you've given me in Christ. I thank you for the sealing of the Spirit unto that day of redemption. I thank you for this old King James Bible, Lord. What a blessed book that it is. And I thank you, Lord, for its each and every word. Uh, uh, God pity the men who change it and defile it and corrupt it. And God, I just ask that you be with us now in the remainder of the service, Lord, as we continue to study your word. We pray that your word would be uh, magnified, that your son would be glorified, and that his body would be edified. And we ask it all in the lovely and precious name of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.